Yes, uh, so in three minutes, we'll start uh, this webinar. Welcome, everyone. Same material. Uh, meanwhile, whoever has entered, you can type in your questions from previous uh, webinars. We would be happy to answer them. So we'll be starting in exactly one minute now. Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, so thank you for joining in for our third session. Uh, uh, my name is Ankit, I'm the co-founder and the director of Objectify Technologies. So during the lockdown, we decided uh, to do the, these, uh, this webinar uh, where we wanted to demystify the additive manufacturing uh, and trying to promote uh, innovators at home. Uh, so we got this opportunity to talk about the additive manufacturing uh, tools and the rules till now we have done two sessions so we tried giving you a uh, overview of the additive manufacturing technology in our first presentation on uh, on 6th of uh, uh, April and uh, on 8th of April we talked about the tools and the rules of additive manufacturing and uh, during uh, the first webinar itself, we were discussing on the different kind of technologies, what is the manufacturing process, what are the prerequisites for additive manufacturing, and what kind of decision making is required during additive manufacturing itself. So we talked elaborately on uh, three factors. So your decision of going into additive manufacturing will depend on three individual factors which are very important for any business. First, time, quality, and cost. So, according to that, you will be taking a decision of entering into additive manufacturing. Once you have entered into additive manufacturing, then it has a different kind of a rule set. So, so, so we discussed on our eighth April webinar, uh, where we got an overwhelming response from uh, the audience also, uh, and 
people ask some brilliant questions i try replying to most of them some are there in a, in my mailbox i have been replying to them ever since and uh, we were quite impressed by the hello am i not audible yes sir you are yes, audible you are. okay okay because i just just saw one someone on the chat saying okay so so we discussed on the rules and the tools required for additive manufacturing itself so there we discussed on uh, what are the project uh, plannings is required for additive manufacturing uh, from the design to the material to the machine and what kind of a cookery book you should uh, follow for additive manufacturing itself so be it on the polymer side be it on the metal side we discussed several kind of uh, cases where only one answer is not a good answer so we discussed on different approaches we follow different things we do and uh, we try to approach the problem uh, quite uniquely for our customers so so that has been our uh, our strength and i think uh, we got a phenomenal response on uh, on the technology itself and uh, we got really brilliant questions from our audience and uh, i'm very thankful for you to join again on our third webinar today we will be discussing on additive manufacturing and its applied application so we are taking baby steps we had initially talked about what is additive manufacturing then secondly we talked about the tools and the rules now we are going to apply it in the real time problem statement so different applications from we will be discussing from aerospace to automotive to space applications to white goods to general engineering so how people are utilizing the technology see the technology is as good as you can use it for so if you are not using it right so it will not give you a right decision right solution also so so that's why like we wanted to talk to you about what you can learn from the examples right now currently uh, some of the customers are using for so 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 what we are trying to understand uh, today is about the application side of the business of additive manufacturing itself so during our today's presentation mr ashish jacob he is uh, one of the uh, person handling both the metal and the polymer sales related activities and he is also one of the application engineer at our office at optifair so he will be taking up the uh, session today and uh, i and rahul pise who is the general manager uh, at uh, objectifier metal facility who uh, will be answering all your questions so please feel free during the session itself to post as many questions as possible to clear your doubts to clear uh, the presumption and the assumptions related to additive manufacturing so that the skepticism changes into optimism and we can go further for additive manufacturing as an implemented technology for your application itself so here is a attendance sheet uh, from here i think uh, mr ashish will be taking up ashish yes, yes. yes. Uh, hi everybody i'll uh, present the attendance metrics of the last webinar we had around uh, registered registered around 245 people and 231 attended we had a 94% attendance rate um, and it was an overwhelming re response we had around 161 questions which came up plus a lot of them came in the chat and uh, now let's move on to the actual present uh, the poll the first poll and uh, shanko i request you to um, um display the question for the first poll now uh, everyone just be patient you will be uh, getting the poll directly uh, on your screen it will pop up and uh, you can register your responses and then you can move for we can move forward i request so, everyone to submit your answers as soon as the uh, the poll panel pops up yes just click on the response and it will get registered and then we'll move ahead so the poll is live uh, you guys can start answering and just press submit and close that it will close yeah hope all of you have registered your answers we'll be displaying the 
poll results in in uh, in, uh, in the upcoming slides. So today we're going to talk about additive manufacturing and applied apl applications. Uh, I'm Ashish Jacob. Uh, I've completed my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Anna University, Chennai, and I did my master's in production engineering from NSIT Delhi. I've been working for the past eight months in objectified technologies, and uh, I'll be presenting this webinar for you. And uh, let's move ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm going to pre present uh, the additive manufacturing and applied applications. This will be primarily for people who are interested in polymers, metal alloys, etc., and new hobbyists who want to enter into the industry. So I'm going to cover various segments, um, both domestic and overseas. Um, it's going to be really interesting. Let's uh, move ahead. I'm going to uh, take up different facets, the space applications, aerospace applications, these um, uh, implants, medical implants, prototyping, automotive, direct applications. I mean, just imagine you can use your, um, you can print and then directly use in particular applications, be it white goods and even the oil and gas industry. Uh, all these facets will be covered in these sessions and these are the different sectors. Now, uh, the additive manufacturing utilization has been brilliant in various, various segments. You can see the chart, how various, uh, what is the market share by technology wise for each of the technologies that is present nowadays. And uh, the market utilization of different sectors, you can see around 19% is the industrial business machines, etc. Aerospace comes to around 12%, motor vehicles, 17%, the consumer products, 18%, mechanical, 14%, like that. It's, it's um, I mean, each, each sector in the manufacturing sec, uh, industry has uh, started utilizing additive manufacturing. And uh, those who are you, uh, seeing this for the first time, um, this is a great opportunity for you to understand the various applications. Uh, now let's start off with uh, additive manufacturing as a prototyping technology. Over the years, manufacturers have actually realized the vast possibilities of additive manufacturing, be it in various sectors that I talked about. Um, Additive manufacturing has proved to be the ideal solution for uh, new product development needs. Like you can have a look at this final product that they want to develop. And uh, before, you know, developing the final product, you can get an overall look and feel of the product and even get proper functional parts to understand how this part will function at the end. And uh, these, for example, these prototypes as well. And uh, now prototyping is one of the best things. Uh, if you want to look for a faster lead time, you can actually reduce the lead time by around 50%. Uh, because you don't have uh, tool manufacturing present, you don't have to design special jigs and fixtures, etc. So you can reduce around 10 to 50% of your lead time and kind of come up with you, the final product in like a very fast, in, in a very, very fast. And thereby you can also reduce the cost of your products as well. Now, uh, talking about prototyping technology, I'll be talking about the wrenches that is shown over here, how uh, it was used in space and how 3D printing in space is a new possibility. And you can see these images, how a trimmer can be manufactured. Um, first prototype to the second, third, fourth, fifth, and then you can fi finally come up with the last um, prototype. And uh, I'll be talking about each of the uh, applications. Now, talking about the direct applications, uh, you must be wondering how could you use the, uh, 3D printing as a final application in your industry? Uh, this company called ADRO, they manufactured actuators, hydraulic valves and systems for the past um, five to 10 years. And uh, they've been able to manufacture various solenoid valves, etc. And uh, these have been directly used in their applications. And uh, this is the example of one of the um, pilots who had lost his left hand due to an accident. And ADRO was able to come up with this device. And uh, they were able to... Um, create this device so that the person can, could just move his leg and fly the aircraft. This, his left hand could not be used because he's, he lost it. So then just by relative movements of his leg, he could uh, move the flaps of his aircraft. And uh, Koenigsegg 11 in the automotive industry has been uh, another pioneer in adopting additive manufacturing. And uh, they've been able to come up with a one is to one power ratio that is yeah, now, um, before that, I'm going to sh submit the poll results. Uh, you can see um, the poll. Uh, are you aware of the various applications of 3D printing? Um, we can see that around 20% are not aware and they are 
they want to learn about it and around 39% have knowledge of a few applications. Okay, that's amazing. And 15% uh, are aware of the applications and haven't, and, uh, but they have seen them in real, they have not seen them in real. And 27%, another chunk has actually seen them. So that's amazing. Um, I can see that a lot of people are ready to learn about this and a major chunk is, is right there. And, and uh, moving on to the presentation, uh, the Coenisig 1.1 is uh, one of the pioneers who has adopted the additive manufacturing uh, technology in their vehicles, be it the upper hood, etc., the struts, the various uh, components, the battery uh, housings, etc., and even the turbocharger uh, was manufactured using 3D printing. You can see the immense possibilities. And even the Zinger 123,233 uh, horsepower hypercar, that was also, uh, they, they've manufactured around 90 to 95 percent of their parts using 3D printing. Uh, be it the front crash structure, etc. They made it out of aluminium and titanium. And uh, they've been fast adopters of uh, additive manufacturing. And uh, talking about Objectify, we've been able to manufacture a lot of turbine blades as well apart from various other um, products that we've delivered. Uh, these are some of the turbine blades that we've uh, made. And uh, you can see all these 1.5 uh, mm cooling channels that are present inside. These are only possible using additive manufacturing technologies. And uh, you can see these images right here. These run through this part. And uh, we've been able to achieve all these products in uh, very less time. Next, uh, I'll be talking about one of the direct applications that you can see in uh, ad using additive manufacturing. Uh, that's the conformal cooling that you could use. The um, conformal cooling, what would you do is that in um, you provide these cooling channels, channels, etc., so that uh, you can have more number of uh, parts. Uh, and uh, the, as the cooling uh, time reduces, you can have least number of rejects, and the part life is more. So uh, a lot of these injection molding companies have been working hard to uh, have least number of rejects and using additive manufacturing technology, they've been able to come up with these cooling channels, et cetera, in order to build better inserts, et cetera. And uh, these, this, this is also one of the uh, components that we manufactured for a plastic molding industry. Uh, this is made of maraging steel. You can see these cooling channels that run through directly inside the part. Now this, I'll be talking about the economic standpoint and I'll be presenting a graph so you can understand why, why is this useful over traditional, uh, traditional cooling. And you can see these uh, cooling channels, these spiral structures inside this particular part. It's, it's not achievable using any other technology. And if you talk about conventional cooling, the cooling rates are here. There's a lot of gap between that. And the cooling rates are less, I mean, the, there's a lot of less gap in between the actual cooling rate. Uh, as you can see over here, this is a simulation re uh, result that was taken from Moldex. And uh, as you can see um, uh, over here, without cooling channels and with conventional cooling channels and with conformal cooling uh, channels, how uh, the, uh, the cooling rate is less. So you can have more number of parts and, uh, and uh, less number of uh, rejects. And uh, why should you use conformal cooling? You can see that around 20% cycle reduction um, gives you around 27% profit improvement. You can have around 20 to 40% cycle reduction. Uh, so with 20% cycle reduction, you're having around 27% profit improvement. And with 30% cycle reduction, you're having around 41% and 40% you're having 55% profit improvement. So that's a, that's a huge number. So you can understand the, the, the best thing about this technology. Now, uh, we're going to have the second poll. Um, Shanko, I, res I uh, request you to um, put up the next poll question. Um, everyone, you'll be receiving the question in, on, your, uh, pay, uh, on your screen. And just register your responses, press submit, and then we'll move forward. Just press submit, and it'll stop, yeah. Yes. I think most of you might have registered your responses. I'll wait for a few more seconds in case if you haven't been able to, it will pop up directly. Ashish, okay. you can move ahead. I'll tell you when the poll results are almost done. We have received a, okay. when we received a ton of. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shonko. So now we're gonna talk about additive manufacturing and automotives. 
Uh, a large number of components have been manufactured uh, using 3D printing in automotives. They've been one of the early adopters in trying to adopters in uh, trying to bring up use this technology to and uh, for their advantage. You can see this bracket that's been man manufactured using SLS technology and various other components I'll be dis displaying so that you can understand how these applications have been immensely adopted by these industries. Be it bellows, complex ducting, high visual prototypes, engine blocks, all these things have been uh, ex uh, adopted by uh, additive manufacturers, all these uh, OEMs and various uh, uh, car manufacturers. Okay, the poll results are out. Um, the question was, were you aware of the conformal, of, of conformal cooling and its advantages in relevant applications? Around 55% were not aware. So that means like this, this was a very good learning curve for you guys. And 15% have read about it. 14% um, uh, were aware, but uh, they've not seen the real life applications and 17% were aware. So uh, I, I hope um, we, I was able to show you certain examples and how you could use it in your particular industries. And um, in case if you have any questions, please don't forget to register them in the Q&A column that's uh, right below. Next. Um, um, now in additive manufacturing um, in automotives, you can see that under the hood components, some of the components can be manufactured using SLS, these battery covers, etc. be it interior accessories like this. You can see this was manufactured using SLS technology. This is how the final product looks like. So you can get an overall look and feel of the product. Air ducts, etc. You can see these air ducts, this one manufactured using um, 3D printing and full scale panels like certain bumpers. We've also manufactured certain bumpers for various automotive companies also and uh, various cast metal brackets etc uh, you could ma manufacture using 3d printing and um, using sla and various other technologies in 3d printing and uh, uh, over here you can see this wishbone these complex metal structures the wishbone uh, you might not be aware of what where this is located uh, this is the, uh, a part of your suspension system in your vehicle um, and the dashboard interfaces, all these things that can be manufactured. And uh, uh, we've also manufactured a lot of uh, components, these uh, headlight prototypes for various companies um, using SLA technology. Now uh, uh, I'll be uh, passing this on to Mr. Rankit Sahu. Uh, he'll be talking to you how Objectify was able to help various, um, various OEMs and automotive manufacturers to move from BS4 to BS6 transition. Hello everyone. So as as uh, Ashish was uh, communicating to you regarding the uh, automotive application, so so there has been a Indian related problem where the Indian automotive companies had a problem uh, with the emission norms. Uh, so it hello hello. Sir, you are not audible. There might be some technical difficulties. Uh, just hold on, guys. Yes. Uh, just a second, guys. Uh, this is some issue. We, we, we're just sorting it out. So, sir, so we'll be talking about this, uh, these cylinder heads, etc., that we manufactured at our um, uh, at our, in the, our labs back in Delhi and uh, aluminium is the main component of this, these cylinder heads, etc. Is Sir uh, back online, Shanko? Uh, I am checking. You can continue, okay. just hold on. Okay, okay. So uh, Objectify has been uh, able to help various OEMs and automotive manufacturers in moving from BS4 to 6 transition and uh, we've help them manufacture these cylinder heads, etc. These are actual, actual functional parts. And uh, uh, these crank cases, etc. that we, we were able to manufacture using 3D printing. This is made of aluminum. And you can see all these fitment areas, etc. all these intricate features. We were easily able to manufacture uh, using 3D printing and uh, help these automotive companies move uh, from PS4 to 6. Is uh, Ankit sir online? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. Just show now. Hello. Hello. Yes. 
we can uh, so you okay. uh, so you going uh, can you disable one mic yes yes i've done that sorry yeah. I, i think uh, bad connection uh, so uh, we were talking about the bs4 to bs6 transition so uh, uh, most of the oems in india who were working on uh, engine development pro- programs because that was the challenge for them to convert all their designs existing designs from uh, a bs4 uh, norm engine to a bs6 norm engine so they found an answer with metal 3d printing and they found an answer with objectify technologies and we were able to uh, work with um, most of the big oems uh, you name any of the uh, two wheeler oem or a four wheeler oem who is doing uh, engine program in house so be it on the petrol side or be it on the diesel side everybody got an answer on 3d printing uh, metal 3d printing as per se with objectify and they were able to get all the engines converted from bs4 to bs6 with the help of objectify itself so so that is a real time problem which objectify solved for its customer and it is changing uh, the definition of applications in automotive in india so uh, similarly an example can be taken from uh, uh, the uk automotive companies so uk mostly is motorsports in automotive in the world so all the uh, all the motorsports companies take additive manufacturing as their primary example for their uh, development of the components and direct to use onto the vehicle so all the formula 1 all the nascars all the lemo cars are utilizing additive manufacturing technology similar to how objectify help all the engine manufacturers in india so ashish you can go ahead after this yes so as sir was pointing out it's an incubator of new technologies uh, these motorsport uh, companies and uh, even half a kilo reduc- weight reduction would actually higher their their chances to win a race now let's take this example um conflux is a company that was able to manufacture this heat exchanger you can see these intricate features etc which cannot be manufactured using conventional technologies they were able to reduce around 22% of the weight and there was high um, heat dissipation uh, can be seen in these in the in this particular uh, uh, heat exchanger and this is a direct application in one of those motorsport companies and uh, even certain uh, student racing formula student racing comp- uh, 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 teams have been able to manufacture various uh, battery housings like this is from uh, an example from germany global formula racing team they were able to manufacture this and reduce the weight and accommodate around 36 cells into their uh, housing and uh, that is only possible using sls and they were able to use that now moving on to the space Uh, industry um ge actually brought a revolution in 2015 they made this leapfrog uh, leap uh, fuel nozzle and uh, they were able to make uh, a lot of components out of these and even most of you might have uh, sit sat in an aircraft and you might have seen these buckle these uh, clamps that are found in your seat belts these you don't require so much material as you can see over here and uh, using topology optimization you can not only reduce the material but at the same time you are reducing the cost because the amount of force etc that is applied is not for that you don't require so much material and an am optimized design is only possible using uh, 3d printing and there are a lot of uh, actual applications uh, that are i mean uh, certain applications that are currently used and potential applications as well uh, be it the wing structure fuel tanks a lot of them are manufacturing fuse large structures they are slowly moving into it oil tanks etc uh, the storage bin dividers bent covers using sls and various other technologies even in the uav industry it's been moving rapidly and the aerospace industry has been utilizing this they've been one of the early adopters and you can see from a 1359 million dollar industry that's moved into a 6000 it will move into a 6745 million dollar industry by 2026 now these are the current applications uh, concept modeling prototypes etc printing replacement parts that is the, those are the current applications in aerospace and uh, the potential applications are am electronics printing aircraft wings which you will see in 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 4 to 5 years as the technology is faster now um, and objectify has been um, uh, one of the has been able to adopt one of the fastest 3d printers in the world it's an industrial 3d printer uh, usm 
and um, these this is one of the rocket injectors that objectify manufactured this is made of stainless steel and uh, you can see all these features these intricate holes etc uh, we've been able to direct these are also direct applications in aerospace sector and uh, these uh, end fittings now as you know the titanium has been one of the lead, um, talked about uh, materials in the aerospace sector um, this is actually the support structure that is present this is uh, chipped off and then you get the final product like this these have been used by one of the few of the aerospace industries in india and these lpft stators that is man manufactured using titanium um, these were also manufactured by um, uh, objectify in our uh, labs and uh, talking about white goods they've also been one of the uh, main adopters of uh, 3d printing like whirlpool they've been able to um, use 3d printers and bring 3d printers nearby their customers and manufacture them um, manufacture these spare parts uh, easily for them so you don't have to wait long queues and wait long hours to uh, and days to get your spare part and in medical um, additive manufacturing medical they've slowly started adopting this technology you can see these jaw implants these have been uh, manufactured using uh, 3d printing and these cranial implants in case if you have an accident and uh, you have to have a cranial implant you can manufacture this i'll show you an uh, a case study so that you can understand better how we are able to do this um as you know that corona virus has been affecting the world lately and how 3d printing has been able to help now you can see this 1 dollar 3d printed mask that was manufactured by a neurosurgeon in usa they were able to deliver this in one day just imagine one day and uh, a lot of hospitals required these i'll be sharing a few more examples later on now moving on to a case study that we had promised before uh, this is one of the live uh, hell, uh, the, the one of the uh, case studies that we've one of the cases we've helped out in monal molanaza the medical college in new delhi uh, there was this patient who had a cancerous formation in his ankle now either they they could amputate the whole leg or they could change use a, a proper uh, implant right there made of titanium and uh, i'll show you how we were able to do that what we did was we did a ct scan this is the ct scan this is how the ct scan looks like and uh, we uh, after um, making the, getting the ct scan we um, provided certain pores etc certain holes etc for the screws etc and uh, these pores etc is essential so that osteo integration happens and uh, uh, the tissue has to grow through this these parts this part or else there will be uh, uh, it will become septic septic and uh, before coming up with this final product in metal we made this in sls so that the doctor in molanazad medical college could analyze this uh, part before we manufactured it and he could suggest certain uh, suge suggestions so that we could uh, in, uh, use it in the final product and this was the final implant you can see the x-ray image of the implant this implant was embedded in his heel and uh, it was completely sterilized and then it has all these uh, pores etc so that the tissue grows in and uh, we um, and it was directly used in that particular person and this is how objectify was able to help um, the society in, at large and uh, talking about uh, uh, going back to corona virus uh, this uh, there is a manufacturer in brescia italy they required replacement valves for their ventilators so uh, the industry they brought their own 3d printer to the uh, hospital and manufactured all these um, replacement valves and this was used immediately as their supply chains were clogged and these um, um, these head covers were also manufactured using sla and additive manufacturing in space has been one of the um, talked about things in uh, nowadays and uh, this was this is one of the 3d printers that can print in zero gravity you can see mr barry uh, he's an astronaut in iss holding a ratchet in his hand then this was actually directly used by him to replace to help replace certain components and uh, relativity space has been able to make uh, rocket science look easy and they've been able to manufacture these this uh, component this is called the eon engine um, it, it has got a lot of injectors etc directly using 3d printing and uh, this is the same product that you see right here uh, the, these are the co-founders and uh, they were able to manufacture this you might if you had seen the second webinar 
uh, uh, Mr. Rahul Pese showed uh, the technology that was used for manufacturing this. And uh, a 3D printed satellite mechanical structure was also manufactured. Um, you can see this Arcade 300. This holds the propellant inside. This is actually a frame of a satellite. These are actual direct applications of uh, 3D printing. Now it's no more a prototype techno prototyping technology. These, this is directly used. Now uh, we'll be talking about ISRO. Uh, I'll be um, passing this on to uh, Mr. Ankit Sahu. He'll, he'll talk about how ISRO has been able to uh, adopt this technology. So hi everyone again. So as uh, Ashish has been mentioning about different applications, uh, there have been different organizations who have been taking additive manufacturing as one of the application for uh, as one of the technology for their application itself. So uh, ISRO has been one of the uh, prime movers of additive manufacturing within the country and they have been really responsible in uh, taking baby steps in the technology itself because as you can uh, understand uh, ISRO is a very responsible organization within the country and very respectable. So whatever decisions they take, uh, they take it uh, very, very robustly. And uh, what ISRO currently is trying to do, uh, they have come out with a, a unique uh, proposition for additive manufacturing itself, where they want to set up their own uh, additive manufacturing facility with the help of a vendor like Objectify and uh, try to make components there itself at their facility with the support and uh, the technical know-how of uh, a company like Objectify. And uh, these, uh, these uh, 3D printing, uh, 3D printed components will be directly installed in the GSV uh, MK3 uh, launch vehicle, uh, the cryogenic engines. And uh, so, so, so they want to work uh, and uh, they want to qualify the materials. They want to work on the number of processes. They want to quantify things. They want to make a normal distribution curve uh, within the uh, within the materials itself, so that it will be easier for them uh, to compare with different technologies like forging and uh, investment casting, which they generally are right now using it. So, so that is the beauty of uh, ISRO itself. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. yes sir, you so, so this is where like uh, additive manufacturing in our country is also taken really seriously uh, with organizations like ISRO, HALs, the DRDOs, uh, the uh, big MNC OEMs for aerospace and the automotive sector. So, so all these companies are taking uh, the initiative in additive manufacturing really seriously and they are seeing this as a, a breakthrough path breaking technology where they can uh, ride onto it and try to find new solutions for themselves. Yes. So yes, you can. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, next, we'll move on to the next slide. Yes. Now talking about the oil and gas industry, a um, lot of industries have started adopting uh, 3d printing and uh, let's take for ex example, uh, Royal Dutch shell. They've been able to manufacture this gas analyzer using 3d printing. And they, they, all these oil and gas natural, um, gas, oil and gas industries have started working with Objectify, and they've been able to, we've been able to deliver real functional parts for them, be it the stators, etc. I'll show you certain examples uh, as we move forward. This is uh, a video that will help you and understand how the process goes about the 3D printing process. Most of you are not aware. You can see how the recoder moves and the laser hits. And layer by layer, layer by layer, you're able to get this final product. This is an accelerator at an accelerated speed. Some of you might be finding it a bit blurred, but uh, don't worry. It's already uh, in an accelerated speed. The powder is remo removed. And then you can see how the final product is um, taken out. This was uh, an, uh, um, a video from Royal Dutch Shell, certain products that they manufactured. Now, this is how the final product will look like. When you take it out from the machine and uh, talking about objectify we've been able to manufacture the world's biggest semi uh, closed impeller this is 380 mm and uh, you can see that most of you were asking uh, last time like support structures etc will be present inside no actually if you were able to um, strategically 
um, strategize your uh, uh, what to say alignment your orientation you'll be able to you you don't require support structures inside and uh, this is one of the examples for that this was uh, this was actually made of uh, stainless steel and delivered to one of our clients and this is another uh, 220 mm closed impeller made of sta stainless steel this is also for an oil and gas application and uh, this inducer as well you can see how thin these uh, blades are around 2 mm thick these these are easily manufacturable using 3d printing now uh, thank you for uh, this uh, uh, listening to this session and uh, now we're going to uh, open up for certain questions etc and uh, uh, next we'll be talking uh, about all these upcoming webinars etc the questions that you've um, that you've written on the chat and i'll be uh, forwarding this to mr ankit sahu and rahul pise they'll be taking it on rahul do, do, do rahul do you want to start with some of the questions already yes posted? yes Yes. so uh, let me begin with one of the uh, very interesting question which had uh, almost digging into deep detail for uh, tooling application so the first question was about uh, conformal cooling that draw my attention so there were a lot of uh, questions in that post i got i could see so we will definitely get back to you uh, answering all those questions but top line summary is uh, conventional cooling channels are made using cnc milling and cnc milling can do up to certain extent uh, complexity it can handle so imagine certain shape that you are going to injection you going to do injection molding for and you designed the mold for that uh, you can only drill orthogonal holes in the mold blocks using the cnc mill because the space is limited you cannot mill out a uh, huge chunk of material out of uh, mold blocks so inlets and outlets you can just design with orthogonal drilled holes and they cannot reach the part surface uh, where exactly the part is so the distance between the cooling channel as well as the part is quite uh, bigger uh, in conventional technique and the rate of dissipation of heat is slower but in case of uh, uh, conformal shapes you can have a degree of freedom uh, open to you you can go as close to the surfaces so there were questions like how close we can go we can go up to 3 mm to 5 mm closer to the hot spot uh, the tool steel is strong enough to uh, allow that and uh, that's the beauty of this technology where you can have any sort of complex shapes so what is the rational and how we can decide uh, that depends on where exactly your hot spots are located how faster you can remove the heat from those hot spot and dissipate it faster uh, and along the same side you have to be careful that you don't do the cold shut of the mold it's cold shut means certain portion of the geometry that suddenly got cool uh, gets cooled and uh, you you are no longer able to inject and that that shot goes uh, uh, bad quality so that is a uh, one aspect you have to take care of so there are simulation software which solves all that so we will answer in detail uh, specific to the person who asked that question so that's all so ankit you can take some other question so a lot of people uh, today have been asking also for uh, any kind of uh, certification objective i can provide on the webinar so i just wanted to take this to take this question forward because uh in in our previous two sessions also a lot of people have asked so why we we are not providing any kind of certification uh, for our sessions of, of this webinar is because see what we are trying to right now engage with you is like we want to share our experiences about the technology and its application and what is needed to be done uh to understand from a company's perspective as you might be knowing that we are not an academia institute or uh, someone who can have a accreditation of giving you a certification itself so that is why we are not currently providing any kind of certification or any kind of uh, degree or diploma uh, for this we will be coming back uh, with our academic partners when we will be doing that we will be coming back to you uh, saying that now we will be providing so we are in touch with some of the universities some of the academic partners so it will be better for you also to engage uh, on those kind of sessions 
where you can uh, get that kind of a certification done but in this you will get uh, some kind of a information from objectify which carries a real time problem so real time of solution real type of uh, problem uh, which objectify has experienced during these seven years uh, we will be in a better position to tell you about that which won't be possible in any other uh, format of formal education of additive manufacturing itself so this is somewhere uh, why we want to talk about uh, uh, these webinars and these experiences in it so so that is where i wanted to impart this because from past three webinars itself i have been getting a lot of questions on this so i just wanted to clear clarify on itself so uh, if you have anything still you can post it in the q and a i will be happy to reply to it so there have been a lot of uh, questions on the uh, on the uh, material uh, layer thicknesses uh, on uh, minimum feature size can two materials be done uh, together or not um, see uh, uh, for the layer thicknesses it depends uh, on the surface quality requirement and the mechanical property requirement and also the biggest thing is the cost effectiveness if you are doing a lower layer thickness itself so you so you have to take a call between cost time and the quality again so if your quality requirement is quite high and uh, you want you are ready to pay some extra cost for it then go ahead for a, a lower layer thick <coughs> sorry <coughs> low lower layer thickness uh, if if you have a certain understanding where uh, the cost is very important but the surface finish can be uh, given away then you should go for a higher layer thickness and you should not compromise on the quality of the component so the mechanical and the chemical property should be retained when you are doing something like this so so it is a very subjective decision making what we do so every material is unique every project is unique so it is upon objectify is experience on additive manufacturing itself how we come up with some solutions like these so so there have been questions like uh, uh, metal printed parts for automotive uh, compared to the conventional part as per the uh, strength itself so mr prasad had, uh, has asked this question so what i want to tell you is like uh, see uh, on the on the strength wise uh, it alsi 10 mg behaves better than adc 12 so again it is a subjective answer so i want to just compare it for you uh, the mechanical properties are higher but your thermal properties are a bit different so for any of the engine components if you are doing both the properties are very important your thermal properties are very important and your mechanical properties are very important so thermal properties the difference is a bit of like it uh, the alsi 10 mg heats up 1 degree per minute later and 1 degree per minute later it cools down so that is the give and take of a designer when he is designing for ls at nmg and whenever he is designing for uh, uh, adc 12 so this is something what we have worked with our customer and this is the information I, uh, we are giving it to you uh, as an experience based uh, question actually so it, is there any limitation for 3d printing regarding the thickness of layer regarding thickness of material so thickness of material uh, we take most of the raw material in uh, powder form so the powder size is a major concern for us so when when let's say if you are talking about metal so the powder size should be between 15 to 45 micron and it should be circular so the agenda behind this is it should have a Uh, low packing density so high packing density sorry so so the powder should be packed so spherical uh, spherical powder can be packed easily so so that is the major uh, agenda there so so you have different problem statement for different uh, questions itself uh, do you want to take uh, uh, rahul any other question yes uh, so any strength testing done uh, for any metal 3d printed parts and what is the uh, difference between cast versus the uh, uh, strength of uh, 3d metal printed any data available that was the question by mr sathi so uh, 
to answer that yes we have to do extensive testing since we are making parts for aerospace application or field duty in oil and gas that sort of impeller if it breaks that's a disaster right and if the field duty breaks that's a smaller uh, penalty factor but if a uh, flying craft is failing that's a disaster of a different magnitude altogether so those companies are definitely uh, very careful and we have a uh, uh, certification programs and testing programs for uh, getting the quality right so in order to get the quality right uh, and no such uh, risk involved we have to do mechanical testing and several other sort of testing to achieve the quality that is essential so we do the, do the testing of uh, uh, any parts that we are fabricating and process that we are qualifying so first of all the process is important so in order to qualify the process the machine and material combination uh, along with the process parameter we have we have to make certain tensile coupons or sharpie in impact test type of coupons so all those sort of testing we do uh, using the testing labs which are qualified lab again so those are government agency certified labs and with them we do that sort of testing and rigorous data of that sort is available with us as well so we can uh, provide those uh, lab testing certificates to the customer that we have done the uh, robust testing and uh, this process is stable now to apply for your end use application and uh, specific to the quality difference between cast versus 3d printed so you can see in case of casting uh, the porosities as well as the void spot is prevalent because uh, of the hot spot but in this case uh, since we are depositing layer upon layer the porosity is totally zero so uh, we have a packing density as ankit was mentioning so uh, since powder is tightly packed uh, the density of, of the material is 99.3 to 8 so depending on which grade of material 99.3 to 99.8 so that's uh, almost like 100% quality uh, with some margin uh, so that that that's the level that you can achieve in case of casting i think the porosity is much higher and uh, the quality is definitely better than sand casting on parity in terms of surface finish as well with the investment casting but it has not yet matured to overpass the forging uh, quality so the forge is still the better but uh, it's uh, just 19 by 20 means 5% difference you can assume so we are very much able to achieve the quality strength requirement and in case of forging you can imagine you cannot make any sort of impeller type of components complex geometries so forge components are mostly load bearing type of a, uh, maybe crank uh, of a engine or axles those sort of uh, very simple components are possible via forging but not the complex components uh, so that's the reason why uh, industry is looking at these technologies very seriously because it gives the strength it is much faster it is less messier operation uh, in, in terms of developing something like a, a, a investment casting or casting it's more of an artistic process as well as a knowledge understanding about where exactly the heat spot would be, how we can design runners, how we can design risers so that the hot spot moves away from the geometry. All those sort of uh, uh, things are experience based and uh, uh, compared to that, uh, the process variation in case of 3D printing is much stable. So once you define the parameters, uh, repetitiveness or repeatability is much higher. So in case of casting, you almost always need to do certain uh, non-destructive type of testing like uh, radiography test and uh, that's that's very common you must do it otherwise your part has a like likely chance if there, is, there are cracks initiated inside to fail so in case of 3d printing is much more reliable i would say so ankit next question uh somebody just asked uh, uh, can uh, somebody print a fuselage of a uh, airplane so that is a very interesting question. So, so people are like saying right now, Boeing is saying like by 2030, they are planning to work with VAM technologies to work on the uh, printing of the fuselage itself. 
so so that is somewhere like uh, right now a lot of uh, people are trying to understand because that will save a lot of time and uh, so so that is uh, a very good uh, domain to be in so there are right now some of the companies who are printing the casing of a rocket uh, for space so there are, uh, is a company called launcher in new york so they are working on printing the uh, the cover itself so they uh, they are utilizing the dmls technology and they they have been really successful in making these vehicles so there are different people trying different things on the technology itself so it depends on your wild imaginations also so so there has been uh, questions regarding the uh, minimum feature size so you, on metal also and on polymer you uh, the minimum feature size is ranges from 0.8 mm to 1.2 mm so it depends on the location of the feature uh, uh, the size of the feature so most of the things can be taken like that um, so and uh, there have been uh, questions like i believe uh, plus minus 0.2 mm uh, tolerance very high on valves i have an understanding secondary machining is required uh, so yes a secondary machining has to be considered uh, for uh, for uh, finishing up to the tolerance requirement for your assembly so so what we generally give our customers as an example uh, the properties of additive manufacturing is above investment casting and below forging on the mechanical property side and the way you take your investment casted product uh, uh, for your final machining like die casted product or something like that you have to work with your additively manufactured product such Uh, in in that way itself because you would be doing that final machining uh, for those components because uh, the repeatability of the tolerance is also one of the key uh, understanding currently so so you have to take uh, uh, a a secondary process as an option for your answering the surface requirements and the tolerance requirement for your product itself uh, is printing a uh, a helmet possible if yes what material so we are working with a lot of helmet making companies so what we are doing prototyping for them so we work with aerostar we work with studs so most of the india's biggest uh, uh, helmet making companies we are working with and we do a lot of prototypes for them so but they are not doing it for impact testing they are using it for uh, their design validation itself so they mostly get it done in polymer so mostly nylon or abs based polymers they are working on with so somebody has asked how this technology is differ- differs in terms of production cost with respect to other technologies uh, as i had mentioned in my uh, <coughs> first presentation itself uh, in other technologies as the volumes increases the cost per product decreases but in case of additive manufacturing the cost per product if the volumes are also increasing the cost per pro- uh, per product will be decreasing very slowly and uh, the uh, the difference the rate of difference will be very low so so if you have a unique design every time you are making a product so additive manufacturing becomes a very good uh, application itself or if you have an el- elastic demand where you don't know exactly how much you will be re- requiring it in the next future so rather than investing into the tooling of it you can do additive manufacturing every time you require a new product so we have very good examples with our customer which are right now with uh, a lot of nda approvals for us so we were not able to share where people are not sure how much they will require so they have not gone with injection molding or with uh, other technology like investment casting or uh, pressure die casting so they are still doing additive manufacturing as one of the direct solution for them so uh, volume justification is also one of the answer for additive manufacturing usage itself uh what is the future of 3d printing according to the value to value so uh so value proposition of additive manufacturing is in respect to design in respect to product realization in respect to time taken to um make the pro- project itself so so it is 
very much uh, value add, added uh, entity to the customer that's why like uh, most of the big organization are putting uh, money into additive manufacturing as their strategic decision uh, to implement it in their future supply chain itself so there are certain examples like this i'll give you one very uh, very amazing example of coca cola coming to us so, so coca cola is one of the biggest beverage uh, making company in the world and uh, coca cola uh, i think everybody might be knowing the name brand of coca cola itself so so they came to us and we were surprised to understand that a company like coca cola coming to us and talking about additive manufacturing we we really thought initially that they will be asking us to prototype their uh, pet bottles but they were really smart enough they had a problem statement and that their problem statement was great like uh, they understand their problem really well so their problem was like uh, see coca cola manufactures uh, a, a pet bottle whichever you take like 200 ml 300 ml pet bottles and they manufacture uh, 40000 per hour so the lines are very fast and everything so these are non human intervened lines and uh, the components uh, required to make them fun functional is are very costly so they wanted to digitize all these components uh, for their uh, future usage and they wanted to uh, only 3d print whenever and wherever required so that is a very beautiful example like how to use this technology and a company like coca cola is using additive manufacturing for their production so somebody also has about indirect application so indirect application here is one very fine example of utilizing additive manufacturing not for your direct product but for uh, uh, working on your systems and your application itself are we required any machining operation after build with 3d printer yes you require surface finishing you require cnc machining for tolerancing you require heat treatment for uh, stress leaving and uh, you might be requiring an uh, added uh, surface uh, improvement uh, technologies like uh, must be anodizing or some other uh, related uh, so somebody is asking on uh, bioprinting uh, so karan i am really sorry that we cannot discuss on bioprinting as that has not been our major domain of expertise so bioprinting i think you it will be a better thing uh, if uh, you can write to us whatever uh, findings we have we will be able to um, uh, showcase it to you so i am just typing in my email id you can write to me and i'll share some uh, other than uh, laser sintering operation does arc welding process find a future towards uh, uh, additive manufacturing yes Uh, so people have been using cladding as a uh, solution for ever since now it has come into the domain of additive manufacturing but people were using a uh, arc uh, or tig as a, a repair related uh, activity where uh, they were filling the voids so now people have started uh, putting those technologies also under the additive manufacturing umbrella so that is also very uh, good uh, domain to work with um how is the 3d printing machine cooled when running for a long time so you have uh, a nitrogen generator and uh, an argon generator uh, argon you need a bank and a nitrogen generator is within the machine so so the complete environment is inert so not too much heat dissipation is coming out of the machine so the only uh, heat source is the laser in the machine itself so that is the way they maintain the cooling rates and everything uh, shall i take one more question yes, yes please two? please please so please. Uh, people are asking how the microstructure of 3d printed parts uh, differ in the case of metals so uh, as we explained the process it is like a, a welding process so the torch is applying a heat uh, and it is a rapid heat heat up and rapid cool up so the torch can be either uh, laser based or uh, electron beam based in our case we are using 400 watt laser so uh, it is very uh, collimated high energy transfer in a very small local zone so uh, the microstructure that gets formed after the 3d printing is very tiny lattice structures 
uh, and those uh, are unisotropic as well because there is a directional property because of the uh, way we can raster and cover the area using those laser beams to solidify one layer at a time. So that's the reason why it is anisotropic as well as the microstructure size uh, in a lattice structure size as well is very small. So that's the reason why we have to do certain post-processing. We make it isotropic using annealing process. So the heat treatment of annealing cycle for those specific grades of material is considered as a post-processing essential step in order to improve the strength of the part. So does that answer you? Okay, Ankit, you can take some other question. Yes, uh, I'm just typing in for some of the... So, yes, uh, additive manufacturing in jewelry and in, let's say, dental uh, is a beautiful uh, application. And uh, jewelry has been using additive manufacturing for almost like 15 years. So most of your jewelry um, right now with complex designing and complex application uh, is done through the additive manufacturing. Most of the uh, jewelry jewelers who are casting these metals uh, know this technology as CAM. So they might not be knowing that it is a 3D printing technology, but they they are using it. So it has been utilized in the jewelry field for a very long time. and. Uh, on the dental side, people are doing a lot of crowns. Uh, there's a there's a company on Invisalign in US who does a lot of aligners, uh, additive ma manufacturer aligners. It is a billion dollar company uh, which manufactures aligners through uh, through SLA process, and which most of the Americans are uh, using it as for as an aligner for their uh, distorted teeth. So most of them have been using it uh, in their teenage. So might be like some of our audience might have also used it in their uh, teenage itself. So for the heat exchanger, the material use can be uh, aluminum or copper. Uh, so so aluminum LS810 mg is a good uh, casting alloy. So, so people use uh, aluminum for heat exchanger application and the copper, copper is a very good conductor. So uh, heat exchanger application can be taken into uh, copper also and the copper is a new upcoming material in uh, additive manufacturing as a design engineer working with some CAD software how what are the so so a lot of people are asking for uh, what kind of uh, job requirements are there for uh, joining into additive manufacturing so in my first presentation i had a slide on prerequisites for joining into the additive manufacturing field so the prerequisite the basic prerequisite is like open brain so you should be happy to learn things and uh, then the second requirement will be you should be happy to work on designs so the third basic technical requirement is like an, any kind of knowledge on cad uh, the computer aided designing and trying to understand what is DFM at least. Uh, so the DFM stands for design for manufacturing. Then after that, you can go up to like DFAM. So that becomes like design for additive manufacturing, but that is another question. So that can be taught within the organization itself. But the prerequisite is to understand manufacturing technologies, to understand the design technologies, uh, to understand what are the processes related to uh, the complete uh, work packages itself. So, so that is very much required. So, somebody is asking uh, for printing the component with fine tubes within. What was the technique used? Uh, SLM or DED? So, SLM is uh, very good for fine uh, holes kind of uh, uh, application itself. So, DED is a very crude way of making large structures uh, by blown powder or VAM. So, so uh, the layer thicknesses will be very high. So the feature size uh, will not be something similar to what you will get in SLM. So that will be a very big feature size what you'll be getting in. Uh, so do you do you research on uh, powder materials as in does uh, your company hold responsible for finding new powder materials? If no, uh, where the idea comes from? 
so so yes uh, more, our company has been working with our customers uh, for development of new powders for their application but it all depends on uh, two or three factors such as if there is a good business case for our customer or range of customers so we take a decision that we just need to develop this powder for our single customer or we can do it for ourselves and then display it as a service which we we can do for other customers also so sometimes ip uh, intellectual property becomes a challenge uh, and uh, <clears throat> so we in that regards if we do any kind of uh, material development we take that responsibility that certain kind of mechanical properties or any kind of required properties for the customer should be uh, within that tolerance limit of our customer and uh, with certain parameters we will be able to achieve that and this is the intellectual property and this is the expertise what objective i hold for our customers so this is where like we come really handy with our customers how non oem users are uh, taking care of uh, ip issues is anybody is facing ip issues yes uh, people are facing ip issues but uh, swa sir uh, i think your question is also coming from uh, your background itself so so what i want to comment uh, on this is like uh, if the component is being sold to you and you are reverse engineering it it is your ip it is not the uh, oems ip still so that uh, the responsibility of the component working out for yourself is your responsibility not the oems responsibility anymore so so that kind of an ip related things is very subjective so we can take up uh, as case by case and we can discuss it uh, for for the with the customer individually uh, how can i get internship in our company so you can get internship by applying to uh, us uh, so you can go on to our website and you can drop a small email with your cv and we can help you out with this uh, can titanium and ss 316l uh, material be used in the same machine is it recommended yes it is rec uh, it can be used but what people generally are doing right now is like they are uh, keeping one machine for one material which is a very uh, very idealistic way of working but uh, due to certain business decisions you have to change the material and you can use uh, uh, the uh, these kind of different uh, grades of material in the same machine but you have to clean really really thoroughly and uh, you should be uh, checking on the contamination again and again and uh, that will be a good practice to do for any way like if you are using the same material again and again in the same machine also ankit let me take couple of questions i see some interesting so people had asked uh, uh, how much is the surface roughness of a metal 3d printed part so it can vary from uh, Two micron R value to uh, six micron to eight micron. So it depends on the size of the component as well as the uh, the layer thicknesses that we have chosen. So the highest precision with that we can go up to two micron R values, and we can go even below that. But uh, uh, that takes R and D again. And for general cases, it it is varying between four micron to eight micron. so it is on parity with the uh, investment kind casting kind of uh, surface roughnesses but it is not as good as the machine surfaces where you can go sub micron level ra values so that that is something uh, can be achieved only by post processing so there are certain post processing techniques up appearing in market which can do uh, chemical or electro polishing Uh, or abrasive jet machining even for the internal channels and all so we are taking hard look on those technologies as well and we we can partner uh, with the uh, companies who can do this type of post processing and achieve your target so do ask those type of inquiries to us as well so we can achieve the quality in terms of surface roughness that you can get so that's a uh, first question and another a uh, very interesting question where i think we and ankit both can pitch in so how how uh, industry is evolving and i think we are tackling these type of questions in the, our fifth session where challenges and demand but the question is very interesting to note and begin a, a trigger the discussion so uh, the production time 
is quite long compared to any sort of uh, molding and all but uh, that we discussed already but how can we reduce the printing times in each processes so how it is being tackled well in the industry so i can give an example on the polymer fund so conventionally the resin solidification the liquid resin solidification technologies like sla they had been in business for past 30 years almost three decade uh, 3d system dominated it but after 30 years their patent got void and a uh, lot of uh, desktop type of machines started to come up in market and they in order to not infringe on their core some of the patents still pending uh, not to infringe on those patents they used unique approach instead of a vat in which uh, the platform is sinking they inverted the uh, system and it, the object is being pulled out and the exposure of laser is from bottom instead of top so with that approach they uh, built certain desktop type of machine then came another uh, brilliant idea that how can we uh, avoid the uh, step of a subsequent uh, layer deposition that takes certain time even with the liquids so instead of that can the liquid uh, the object can be just uh, submerged in the part part can the solidifying part can be just submerged under the liquid and it is continuously growing it is continuously getting solidified how can that be achieved so there is a company called carbon 3d which came into existence in 2014 15 so they achieved that uh, with a very unique approach and it, the process is called clip and with that approach they can grow parts at 100 times faster so this type of innovation is coming in the market and uh, as the technology and industry is maturing and evolving uh, you will see uh, very brilliant uh, solutions to these type of uh, problems and that's what we are going to discuss in the session five yeah so Ankit, there, you can add on metal side if you have some example so there can be one example i can share in order to uh, cut short the time on setup so there had been certain uh, subsidiary automations involved so automated guided uh, vehicles for loading and unloading of a raw powder uh, automatic circulation of that raw powder to transfer from the build chamber to the dispenser so that uh, next cycle can immediately begin so all that sort of automations are helping on metal front as well uh, and there are some more that ankit can add yeah. so there is a very interesting question rahul uh, can additive manufacturing be considered a green technology very interesting question uh, so so additive manufacturing so what what does green stands for is a basic thing uh, which uh, people take it for a very uh, granted level of uh, uh, terminology itself so green under uh, green means like the life cycle assessment so so if you understand uh, the uh, any product so if you do a life cycle assessment of any of the product uh, you are working with uh, so you have to understand from where the raw material starts to, to where after you the usage it dies off so so additive manufacturing in as a process is yes a green technology because it utilizes lesser amount of energy if compared to other technologies itself uh, but uh, additive manufacturing as a wholesome cannot be considered a green technology because uh, because it uh, the powder making and the uh, level of uh, understanding of making a laser and everything it is a very uh, carbon extensive uh, process itself so that is where like you should be able to answer it is a very subjective question so so we have to narrow it down and ask specifically what exactly are we trying to tackle right now and right then itself so i uh, think it there, it there is, is there yes, is one yes. more layer to this type of questions and uh, different perspective as well. So uh, I can see one angle of uh, answer to that sort of question is sustainability means can the uh, 3D printed material be reused? So people are very careful of nowadays about packaging material which gets wasted and landfills and all. Uh, so recyclability of those uh, uh, materials and getting materials from sustainable sources so yes industry is working on these type of problems to be tackled so most of the food grade type of uh, uh, pet material uh, 
there are certain companies like ultimaker they are making the filaments using that sort of a waste product and that sort of a 3d printed object using pet material which is a pet is a water bottle material that you everyday drink the disposable water bottles so that sort of uh, innovation is going on in the industry so yes uh, it can be a green solution for some of the applications yeah yes so rahul you want to take another question yeah uh, people are asking how to source certain uh, literature on these topics and where can i get books or uh, study material i think uh, people want to put efforts and tackle this type of challenging problems i welcome them to uh, enroll themselves in research and uh, 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 solve this type of uh, speed related problem or sustainability related problem or recyclable material so uh, there are institutes who are running uh, uh, full dedicated programs uh, nit varangal i think has a, a dedicated uh, additive manufacturing masters course similarly some other uh, private institutions in india as well as across the world are offering those uh, coursework almost all iits nits have uh, this type of uh, uh, at least two or three uh, courses in the entire master or bachelor programs not if not dedicated so there are a lot of literature available in uh, online as well so any sort of uh, advanced manufacturing journals if you pick up you will get to see the latest uh, research published people tackling the problems to improve the different aspect of the technology in order to uh, beat uh, the conventional problems and uh, pushing develop all the time so yeah for the basic you can uh, just last couple of sessions we refer to the 3d hub and those sort of things so those who are very new and uh, uh, maybe undergrads level or uh, maybe uh, students uh, in early teens they can as well learn about it uh, there are websites like 3d hub and all they publicize uh, very basic essential uh, problem solving and question answers yeah okay so there is one uh, question from mr gaurav joshi uh, is hal using am metal parts that is currently Uh, air worthiness uh, and running uh, so gorav uh, right now hal is a production unit it is not a certifying unit so uh, the indian defense and uh, related uh, uh, subsidiaries have a for air worthiness they have a semilac so semilac is uh, some someone uh, who certifies any air worthiness uh, related problems so there are some projects right now currently we are also uh working on uh, for the semilac uh, certification uh with hal uh for their uh, direct application on to the aircraft itself so semilac is somewhere uh, someone who is a third party who certifies an air, air worthy part itself so so i think that will be an answer to your question itself uh, there was one question i saw will all the sessions focus on automotive only or are there any other applications uh, you are going to showcase i think uh, somebody has joined only during the auto session discussion and haven't got a exposure to other applications so if possible uh, ashish can you flash some of the uh, other applications and i can meanwhile answer that question so uh, we recently got our uh, as 9100d certification that is specifically dedicated to all flying parts so that that clearly says that if we had put effort and qualified ourselves for those sort of applications means there are a lot of uh, companies playing in that area so aerospace is one area similarly oil and gas is another area uh, where we are giving the field duty direct end use part medical is another area that Uh, ashish is flashing so it's not just automotive focused uh, we have applications in aerospace uh, aviation sector uh, defense sector uh, as well as the medical uh, appliances uh, other white goods yeah 
quite a lot of other applications as well so somebody has asked uh, again uh, same question uh, is additive manufacturing cost effective than any other process any other conventional process so as i have rightly said again and again uh, is it it all depends on your application it all depends on your what kind of matrix you are trying to satisfy is it the cost is it the quality or is it the time so currently most of the aerospace companies for them uh, production order is 10 10 in numbers so so for them additive manufacturing becomes a very viable solution if in term of cost versus uh, the quantity is taken uh, but if you take example of an automotive company and uh, their minimum requirement will be a million or a uh, hundred thousand or let's say ten thousand so then additive manufacturing becomes a very challenging technology for them to satisfy that kind of a uh, requirement itself so so it all depends on what level of utility you are in and what level of understanding you have of the technology and what kind of an application you're trying to serve so it all depends it all depends and you in my first presentation itself i had explained how you can take up something like this as a solution for your application okay so i think we answered around 88 or 90 questions in overall uh, very few are open and uh, time is almost 620 so, so so i'll i'll answer one one last question yeah yeah please please so somebody um, had asked a costing method in 3d printing so costing method in any of the uh, technology manufacturing technology is mostly same so it depend on the material cost it depend on the machine cost it depends on the how you are utilizing your machine so mostly people take hourly and it also depends on the setup cost what kind of setup so if you are doing hundreds hundred pieces at a go then the setup for that hundred pieces will be in the sum cost of the hundred pieces itself but if you are doing those 100 pieces in 10 batches so that uh, setup cost will be divided into the 10 batches itself so uh, so it uh, the the costing method is similar to any other technology you take in so we cost it accordingly and uh, the, it follows the same pattern as any other technology itself uh, rahul yeah so uh, i think uh, we covered quite a lot of ground so 90 odd questions are answered uh, just few are pending we will get back to you uh, we need some time to think about the, those sort of questions and that's the reason might be for lagging on those questions so uh, we definitely uh, will answer almost all questions uh, and we are going to share the ppt content uh, after uh, end of all the sessions so we will send it as a bundle uh in a, a letter of appreciation kind of uh, email to uh, participants so that they have a memory of us as well as what topics we discuss and they can always refer to whenever they have a, a, a memory that oh uh, something like this i had received as a message and uh, something like this i had attended in a webinar and i see a best use case of those sort of techn technologies that we can avail Uh, with objectify and you can come back to us and we can work together so that's the purpose of uh, uh, this uh, webinar so that you gain insights learn about uh, nuances what considerations are essential to make certain objects happen uh, then what are the uh, benefits you can derive uh, where a current industry is right now and how you can withdraw and exploit the power of these uh, digital automations and direct digital manufacturing platforms so that was our purpose uh, for first three sessions and we demonstrated almost extensively covering variety of segments uh, industrial applications live case studies uh, some inspiration from overseas some of the uh, contributions to the indian industry uh, that we did at our end so we covered that and the next two sessions will be uh, we will be co covering Can you, and Ra Mr. Rahul, can you can you give the cue to Sankha for this? Yeah, yeah. So, Sankha. Uh, Sankha, yes, uh, yes. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining in. We will be uh, covering uh, in the next two sessions. We will be covering all the questions you have, the misconceptions, the failures of three D printing as well, 
so it's all not a uh, bed of roses so there have been some problems as well so it will be really exciting to see what is in store for the next two sessions uh, the two sessions will be held on 12th and the last one will be on 14th uh, you will be receiving a bundle after that uh, including all the question answers uh, including a couple of uh, presentations as well so uh, make sure you are uh, available to join at the same time and we will be sharing the link as well to all the people who have registered um again i would like to acknowledge everyone who have joined i would like to acknowledge uh, mr ankit sahu mr rahul pise nishant kashyap and our presenter mr uh, ashish jacob uh, thank you so much uh, and thank you again for your valuable time so uh, we'll be meeting again in the next sessions uh, hope to see you there thank you so much thank, thank you so much Thanks. thank you thank you